If you're on Zoom, I'd love to see you in person at the hall. If you can all, at all make it out to any of the meetings uh, this coming week, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, there'll be meetings at this place at the hall, 7.30 p.m., Wednesday for Bible study and prayer. Uh, we're studying um, in... Uh, <clears throat> First John chapter 3, verse 8, about, is that right? Sorry, I should have looked that up, confirmed that. Uh, and then Thursday, Friday will be for prayer uh, in light of the upcoming gospel meetings and perhaps ministry at that time as well, 7.30 p.m. Sun next Lord's Day is today uh, at 10 a.m. for the remembrance of the Lord, breaking of the bread, drinking of the cup, and 10. 11.45 for uh, Sunday school and Bible reading, and then 7 p.m. for the gospel meeting, again, next Lord's Day evening. Now, we're very happy to have with us Mr. Eddie Wong from the assembly in Vancouver, uh, Victoria Drive in Vancouver, and we're thankful for his willingness and his exercise to be with us. And I'm, I'm just going to open very briefly for Eddie, reading a few verses from the Bible and get, then stand down to give him plenty of time. So if we can open first to the gospel of <clears throat> the gospel of uh, Matthew, New Testament, first book in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22, verse 42. Matthew 22. Verse 42 says, those are the words of the Lord Jesus. Jesus asked them, saying, well, the Pharisees were gathered together, 41. Jesus asked them, saying, what think ye of Christ? A question I'd like to ask you tonight. What think ye of Christ? Or to ask yourself, what do you think of this man that we talk so much about here in the gospel hall, the Lord Jesus Christ. What think ye of Christ? In chapter 27 of this book, we read the words of another a man, <clears throat> a very powerful man, a judge, very powerful Roman judge, Pilate, chapter 27, verse 22. Pilate saith unto them, this is during the trial of the Lord Jesus. Pilate speaking to the priests, chief priests and elders of the people of Israel. Pilate said unto them, what shall I do then with Jesus? What shall I do then with Jesus? Which is called the Christ. And we've been singing about that, haven't we? What will you do with Jesus? That's a question that kind of rings down to our ears today. In the meeting tonight, what would you, what is your answer going to be? You have to make a decision. You have to make a choice tonight. Will you continue to reject the Lord Jesus? Will you continue to put off the question of your salvation? Will you continue to, to say no to God's call to your heart tonight? Will you continue to seek your own way or will you? Heed the call. Uh, will you? What will your response be? What will you do? Pilate said, "What should I do with Jesus, which is called Christ?" What was their their awful their 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 sad response? Was they all say unto him, "Let him be crucified." The governor said, "Why? What evil hath he done?" And they cried out the more, "Let him be crucified." 
in another place we read, we will not have this man to reign over us. We will not have this man to reign over us. How sad. How sad. <clears throat> the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, had come into this world, but he was rejected by many. He was rejected as on a whole by his own brethren, his own people. They turned their back to him. How solemn a thing to turn your back on God, to turn your back on God's provision for your soul's salvation. You know, we must recognize that we are, we are creatures of God. We are, we are God's creation. God formed man and woman in, the, in his own image. And what a wonderful body we have, really. What wonderful, amazing uh, faculties we have. We have a brain that, that is capable of, of rational thought and, and, and has wonderful capacity. And, uh, <clears throat> and God has given us an ability to make decisions and to choose and to, uh, we see that even from the very beginning, Adam and Eve in the garden, uh, such a wonderful place. Uh, what a place it must have been to, and to be able to experience God's creation that, that wasn't tainted by sin yet. Uh, but we see an enemy come in, and we see de de uh, deception come in. We see challenging of God's word, and we see uh, men and women choosing to choose, making a choice to turn away from God, to disobey God's command. What a in a, in a, in a simple way that that can be that can be seen in the world around us, can't it? It can be seen uh, in in a world in a in a system that is is working hard it seems to to we're using our rational thought we're using the the wonderful brain that god has given us uh well some people some people think we're just animals some people think we're uh, we're just like like the monkey in the zoo that we live and die like animals what, a, what an awful lie that is. What an awful challenge to God that is, isn't it? Because in, in the creation story in Genesis, we read of how God formed man in his own image. He made, he made men and women different than animals. And God breathed into man the breath of life, and man became a living so men and women, boys and girls, we have, we have, we have, we're a higher ability than animals. We're not animals. We're, we're, we're created in the image of God. God loves you. And God's desire is to have a relationship with you. Just like he had with Adam and Eve in the garden. He communed with them. He had a close relationship with them. He walked with them. And he wants to do the same with you. But unfortunately, sin came in and disrupted that beautiful relationship that God had with man. And now we are, uh, we are lost without, uh, if you're not saved in a meeting, if you've never had a time when, when you've placed your faith and trust in the Savior, then we're lost, you're lost and separated from God. You're in spiritual darkness. You're, you're headed to a lost eternity. You're headed to a place where, uh, where the judgment and the wrath of God uh, against sin will, will be uh, felt. If you reject God's provision that he has made for you to be saved. That's the, story, that's the message of the gospel is that provision has been made. That there is hope. That there is a, a way for you to be saved and to be uh, to have that relationship renewed with 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 your Creator, 
and to live a life here on earth with hope for the future. Live a life on earth with uh, the, the, sure, the assurance of a home in heaven when this little launch pad, as it were, this, that's all our life is really. We've been reminded this morning of how, how brief life is, how quickly time passes by. We read in Psalm chapter 90 there, the 90th Psalm, how quickly time flies by and, <clears throat> and then we fly away. Time, our little life is over. But that's not the end. Eternity is ahead of us. You want to enter in eternity resting in the arms of the Savior? Or do you want to enter into eternity resting in your own ideas, in the ideas of the world? You know, I was just thinking, I uh, thought this before, I'd probably mention it before, but we're, men and women are capable of great things. The, the inventions, the iPhones, are, are, they're amazing. They're wonderful. This iPhone probably contains, I mean, it contains amazing technology. If you think of, of all the technologies in the world, we, there's, a, there's a, 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 a space telescope orbiting the sun one, one and a half million kilometers away right now, taking pictures into the, the vast universe and, and opening the eyes of humans to, to how, how great and vast this universe is. And it's still not at the end. Men and women are capable of amazing things, but, but all these things, they deteriorate. They, 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 they pass away, they, they fail, they break. They, cars wear out. Everything, everything we touch just disintegrates, really. But God, God is different. God is, God is great. And God is, it, with, with God, God can give you life everlasting. God can give you life that will never fade away, that will never, that will never diminish. If you choose this day to, to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you will have a relationship that will never, never be broken, never pass away. God promises that he will never leave you, nor forsake you. In uh, Joshua, <clears throat> Joshua 24, verse 15, we read, uh, we read a challenge that he made to the people. Joshua 24, verse 15. Joshua says to the people of Israel, if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods, small g, which the idols, which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods and the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But for me as my, and my house, we will serve the Lord. Choose you this day whom you will serve. And that's a challenge to you. There's a, there's a lot of ideas and philosophies and uh, pulling at you today in the world as you younger ones get further into the world. And, and there's a lot of, there's a desire to, for our society to turn our backs to the things of God, to turn our backs to, to the, moral, the moral realities that God has set forth before us in his word. There's a desire to, to turn right into wrong and to turn wrong into right. 
There's a desire to, to put God aside, to ignore what God has laid out so plainly for us in, in his word and in our conscience. There's a desire to, to lean on our own understanding, for man to lean on their own understanding. But my friend, that is such a dangerous place to be, to, to be, uh, have such an a, 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 a unsound foundation to place your life on. Place your life on the solid rock. Place your life on the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who loved you and gave his life for you there at Calvary's cross, who died, who, who, who was lifted up at Calvary and bore upon himself the judgment for sin that we deserve to bear. He took your place. He took my place. Will you put your faith? Will you put your trust? Will you accept him? Will you rest in not on your own understanding, not on the philosophies of the world, not on the, the ideas that men generate. You know, they're, they're all, men have had good ideas, but there's nothing like God's word. Men's ideas, many of them, most of them have problems. Most of them fail. Most of them don't, don't, uh, don't stand in light of God's word, but God's word is true. God's word is sure. God cannot lie. And we want to point you to God and to Christ this evening. Place your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Choose to serve the Lord. Choose to serve God. Accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. And you will have peace and sure hope for eternity. And as the meeting goes on, as our brother speaks, we pray that you'll simply come to Christ in all your need as a sinner. It's a pleasure to see all of you that have made the effort to come out tonight. Thank you very, very much for being here. I'd like to read with you uh, one passage, Mark's Gospel, Chapter 5. The Gospel of Mark, Chapter 5. And I would like to read from verse 21. Mark's Gospel, Chapter 5, reading from verse 21. I'll just say here as you're turning there, I was just thinking as Simon was speaking, uh, only the, the, the thought was simply this, as he spoke about that telescope peering into the universe, I was just thinking about how I remember somebody in a, in a space capsule blasting off from Earth said that, you know, as you go up in space, you get about 50 miles up or 80 kilometers and there is no atmosphere, there is instant death. The very fact that in outer space, it is really an empty vacuum. There is no life outside of this planet in which we live. None that we know, but really when we think about the word of God, regardless of what you may think about what is beyond our planet, the very fact that God has created you and I, we find ourselves in the center of God's focus. The very fact that you and I live in this beautiful planet that uh, sadly is uh, deteriorating day by day. But I was just thinking with, before we read here, only that that's really evidence that God exists, that he has created you and I today. The very fact that we have a beautiful blue planet uh, with an atmosphere around it. And the very fact that we are located such that if we were any closer to the sun, we would all burn up and be too hot. We're a little further, we would all freeze to death. We have a magnetic field that protects us from all of the radiation, <clears throat> the harmful radiation that comes from the sun. That's not a coincidence. The very fact that we are where we are because God has made you and I for a purpose. And that purpose is to be saved. And so I wanna ask you this evening, have you ever accepted the Lord Jesus as your savior? Take, take heart and be comforted that you are here for a reason, that God is real, and one day you will meet God. Are you ready? 
Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, reading verse 21. And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her that she may be healed and she shall live. And Jesus went with him and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue uh, of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, thou seest the multitude thronging thee and sayest thou, who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And he comes to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and seeth the, uh, the tumult and them that wept and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he saith unto them, why make ye this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn, but... When he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the dam damsel and them that were with him and entereth in where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha Kumai, which is being interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of 12 years. And they were astonished with a great astonishment. And we trust that God would bless us the reading of his precious word and what we have read already. I've been thinking a little bit uh, simply of the, my topic, my overall outline is really emergencies. And when I think a little bit about an emergency, we have two people here and they are in urgent need of medical attention. They're very seriously ill, you know? And I was just thinking specifically, if I can relate this on a personal aspect, I have two relatives that recently were on a Mediterranean cruise, or let's, let's just say this just past Monday, they were on a Mediterranean cruise. The younger relative took sick on that cruise and wasn't feeling very well. She went to the uh, ship's doctor on this cruise ship and the doctor said, uh, you've got nothing but ind indigestion, just go back. She started feeling worse on, she felt bad on Monday. She felt uh, slightly better on Tuesday. Worse again on Wednesday, she went back to that doctor on the, on the cruise ship, this is just this past week, and said, you know, I have a medical background, I need an ultrasound. And so the doctor finally said, all right, when you dock into the port of Naples, Italy, on Thursday, we'll get you an ultrasound at that hospital. And so when she went into that hospital, she found that her appendix had burst. And because of that burst appendix, uh, she had immediate emergency surgery. And because of that, she's thankfully four or five days in recovery in the hospital just at the outset before she can come home. A canceled Mediterranean tour at the outset, a canceled cruise ship tour, and a canceled trip to Europe further, but all because of a serious emergency. I think of that situation where uh, my relative, she absolutely needed help. It was completely urgent. And when I think of the gospel of God's salvation, if you're not saved tonight, you have a spiritual emergency. The very fact that you need urgent attention, not because of perhaps some underlying health issue that you have, and that itself is very, very important, 
But the very fact that the Bible tells us that you have this spiritual disease called sin, and sin is 100% fatal. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sin is 100% fatal. I think of what it tells us in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. And as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. So we can't put it off. We can put off a, a dentist appointment, a doctor's appointment, some other appointment. But when it comes down to the very fact that you and I, because of sin, we will all die. We cannot put off that appointment. And so that's why I am so thankful that we have this gospel meeting here tonight, that the gospel is good news how that you can have your sins forgiven, how you can have peace with God and everlasting life, to, to know the Lord Jesus, your Savior, and to be guaranteed of a wonderful place called heaven. There's no doctors in heaven because nobody gets sick. There's no sadness. There's no broken arms. There's no burst appendices. There's no other kinds of illnesses because heaven is a place in Revelation where God says he will wipe away all tears from their eyes. It is a place of absolute joy, absolute peace, and absolute beauty. If you think the world in, in which we live is such a beautiful place, and yes, there are so many beautiful places, think about a world that will be remade, a world where there is no pollution, there's no crime, there's no need to lock your doors or to lock your windows when you leave at night. It is a place of absolute safety, absolute holiness, and absolute beauty, a place being in God's presence, where you will be in God's presence for all eternity. Do you want to be in God's heaven? And so I can't help but think that this is a spiritual emergency if you're not saved. I took the liberty this morning or uh, earlier on to learn a little bit about the Abbotsford Regional Medical Facility and Care Center. I was impressed that there was an emergency room and that is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In fact, when we look at the hospital here, I was also impressed that it is a level two trauma center. What does that mean? That means that any person that comes into that hospital with a serious illness, there are specialists there to meet that need, regardless of what health issue you have. Initially, there was somebody to help you. I think of God's salvation. I think of the very fact that the Lord Jesus could say to everyone, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. There is he that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. The very fact that the Lord Jesus is welcoming men and women and boys and girls to come to him as a sinner, acknowledge your sin, that you are a, a guilty, hell-deserving sinner, but yet when Jesus died on the cross, he died for me. He, not what or, or what can I do, but he is the remedy for sin. Do you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior? In verse 21, I've just been so impressed that as he got off that ship, we read that many, many people, they came to him. This is a day and age without Facebook, Twitter, social media, without cell phones, technology, as we were hearing about. This was a day and an age where people were excited to see him. They came to him out of all of the villages and the surrounding areas, and there was no entertainment. There, there, there was no uh, musical act or uh, anything that would attract the eye, yet they came, the multitudes from every quarter, to see and to hear God's beloved son. Why was that? He was, he was able to offer them something that they did not have in, that, in the situation they found themselves in. He offered them hope. Can I ask you tonight if you have hope? What will happen when you die? Where will you be in eternity? Did you ever realize that a lot of the issues and the problems, well, the problems that we face and all of the, the challenges that we cross our, that cross our pathway, God has a plan for that. The very fact that if you're not saved, he is using those adversities to make you realize I'm here for a short time and then I will go into eternity to meet God. That's the reason why we have all of these difficulties to turn a sinner to God, to search out why does this happen? And really because of our stubbornness and because of our sin, sometimes it takes a big intervention to turn us around. And so our hope and our prayer would be that you would simply sit in this gospel meeting and that you would realize 
in the safety and the peace and comfort that we have right now to understand that God loves you, that you have a never dying soul, a soul that will live forever, even though your body will go into the ground, your soul will go out to meet God. And if you are saved, if you have a time in your life when you have personally accepted the Lord Jesus, your savior, you will be in that place called heaven for all eternity. But if you reject so great a salvation, as Simon has already said, sadly, you will be in a place of eternal pain, eternal sorrow, and eternal suffering for all eternity. Hell in the lake of fire. That is a place where you don't have to be there. Can we make it very, very clear that the Bible tells us in John chapter 3, verse 16, that for God so loved the world. That's not the rocks, the, the trees, and uh, the oceans. But for God so loved a world of sinners, men and women and boys and girls, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him, not church attendance, not baptism, not anything that you or I could do, that whosoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ should not perish, but have everlasting life. The measure of how much God loves you is the measure of the gift or what he was willing to give so that you can be saved. The Bible tells in 1 John chapter 1 that uh, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanseth us from all sin. That is the measure of how much God values your never dying soul, that he was willing to give his only son in that you could, so that you could be saved from your sins. You could have peace with God and a home in heaven. I'm looking at parents in the audience, and of course, uh, we have children that uh, we have raised. I would never consider giving my son or my child for sinners as a sacrifice. And yet, uh, God in his matchless infinite wisdom and his love and mercy towards us, even though we don't deserve it, he has sent his son into this world to die there upon the cross of Calvary so that individuals that hated him without a cause that could cry to him, crucify him. We will not have this man to reign over us. Individuals that would spit in his face or to drive those nails into his hands and feet uh, there. And as they nailed him to the cross, these individuals and you and I, we could be saved from our sins. We could be ransomed. We could be brought back to God because of the ultimate price of God uh, offering up his son as the one and only complete, perfect sacrifice for sin. And really today, if God is satisfied by the death of his son, can you be satisfied this evening? The blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanseth us from all sin. We have an emergency here in Luke's gospel, uh, Mark's gospel, chapter 5, verse 22. We have a father. His name is Jairus, and he is desperate to see the Lord Jesus. In fact, what is so interesting about this is here's a man that is responsible. He has responsibility in that synagogue. He likely was quite well off, but yet he was absolutely powerless to uh, help his daughter get well. And, you know, that's just the reality, you and I today, that despite all of our uh, affluence or what we have, we are unable uh, when we're sick to save ourselves. We need medical attention. We need help to be delivered from an illness. In this case, a terrible fatal illness. That's an, again, an illustration about sin. No matter what you have, what your status is, you cannot save yourself from your sin. You need God's beloved son to save you. I think it's very fascinating when you think of the name Jairus. Um, it, it, the, the definition of, of Jairus is really whom God hath, I'm going to look this up here, whom God enlightens. I find that very amazing because really enlightenment and understanding. There are some that are on our online audience and some that are in this audience today, and God has enlightened you. You have been extremely privileged to hear the gospel on a regular basis. You need God's salvation. What a blessing to hear the gospel on a regular basis. I hope you respond to the message because this is an urgency. We don't know how long you have on this earth. We don't know how long each and every one of us has on this earth. So we need to be saved. That's why the word of God tells us in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, um, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. And so really, when I think of the very fact that uh, there is an urgency, God says that if you want to be saved, you need to strive 
to make it your top priority to be saved because we do not know what God has in store for us or where we will be at tomorrow, even tonight. And so the Bible tells us now is the accepted time. Now is a day of salvation. Here's the, here's the father. His daughter is desperately sick. I want you to notice that my, in verse 23, my little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her that she may be healed and she shall live. You know, that point of death, again, it just reminds us, we will all die and we will all go out to meet God. Are you prepared? And when I think of verse 23, and I'm just going to make a few comments here as the time is going very quickly, but <clears throat> notice he asked the Lord Jesus to lay his hands upon her so that she may be healed and she shall live. He is the only one. The Lord Jesus is the only one that he is asking to heal her, uh, heal his daughter. There is complete and perfect healing for sin, for your sins, 100% forgiveness, not because of anything that you have done, but because of what the Lord Jesus has done upon the cross, how that when he shed his precious blood, that can cleanse all of your sins away. Think of all the sins that the bad thoughts you have uh, that's, that has crossed your mind. Think of all the, the, the harmful, hurtful things you've said or all the things that you've done. Every single sin can be forgiven, can be washed away because of uh, his precious shed blood that was shed at Calvary's cross on your behalf and mine. I take comfort in the fact that when Christ died upon the cross, all of my sins, all of your sins were in the future. There isn't a single sin that the blood of the Lord Jesus cannot wash away. You can be completely spotless and pure and forgiven in God's sight because of all that the Lord Jesus has done. Notice verse 23, lay thy hands upon her that she may be healed and she shall live. Is there anybody here that would like everlasting life? This life that we live goes by very quickly. Uh, I see so many in the, in the crowd today or in the audience and I remember, hard to believe, 30 years ago when I first started coming into visiting this assembly, uh, that's gone by very, very quickly. And we, we grow older, some of us get sick and unwell, and some pass into eternity. That's just the reality. And so uh, I take comfort in the fact that although we get older and our health fails, that we have an eternal hope that cannot be taken away. Do you have this hope of eternal life? through our Lord Jesus Christ. Come and lay thy hand upon her that she shall live. Uh, wonderful to think that uh, we can have everlasting life through our Lord Jesus. Notice that as we start in this story, it breaks up for a moment. And there's a woman that she has a serious disease in verse 25. She has gone in verse 26 to see the many doctors and they couldn't help, help her, but her health is continually getting worse and worse. You know, I, I think of, the very fact that people in the world today, you can run from God, you can turn from God, but nothing will, will heal you from your sin. There is nothing that will bring lasting joy, lasting satisfaction, lasting healing apart from our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a reason for that. Because when God created us in Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 3, he made us with a purpose that we would have a relationship with the God of eternity, the one who created us. That means everything you do apart from God because of sin will never give you lasting satisfaction, lasting joy and peace. Oh, there's going to be things that will fill your time. Uh, and, and there's going to be things that will entertain you for a time, but they will not bring a deep, lasting inner peace that only the Lord Jesus can give you. That is why you think of all of the people that are rich and famous. Uh, some of them go on well, but yet many. Their marriages are a wreck. Their careers are a wreck. They turn themselves into rehab for substance abuse. They're in trouble with the law. And these individuals that are supposed to be the pinnacle of success, yet because of sin, uh, it all ends in sorrow and heartbreak and disappointment. That's why we sometimes sing, now none but Christ can satisfy, none other name for me. There's love and life and lasting joy, Lord Jesus found in thee. There is true peace and joy and lasting satisfaction through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know the Lord Jesus, your Savior? But I think a little further, 
that uh, here she is. She is following the Lord Jesus in verses 27 to 33. She just touches his garment. She strives. It's not the striving that saves her, that heals her. It was the power of the Lord Jesus. But that striving, she was willing to, uh, she was willing to overlook all of the dirty looks of the people, all of the crowd, what would they think of her? She was willing to overlook that. And just in her meekness and in her humility, she reached out and touched the garments of the Savior as he was walking by. She made the most of that opportunity. There was no guarantee that he would be coming through that way again, but she realized her need. And as a result of that, she reached out in faith believing that he was the only one that could save her. And the power of the Lord Jesus healed her from that affliction. And so we want to be very, very clear. Striving means make it your first priority. Be urgent and desperate to get salvation. But it is really the power of the Lord Jesus that healed this individual. And really tonight, it is the precious shed blood of our Lord Jesus, his finished work upon the cross that can save you from your sins for time and for eternity. And so really tonight, we have a happy story that this woman, she gets healed from her affliction. Wonderful that you could leave this gospel meeting knowing that your sins are forgiven. You have peace with God and a home in heaven. Not because of what you have done, but because what he has done, that it was he who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, and on the third day, he arose again, according to the scriptures. So we have a risen Savior. We're going to read a little bit. I'm getting ahead of myself here. So I'm just so pleased about this lovely story. But we have a young girl that is raised back to life, the power of the Lord Jesus. And that's really just the foreshadowing that if he could raise up that girl that had died back to life, then really he could raise himself back to life. He could say, no man taketh my life from me. I lay it down freely of myself. I have power to lay down my life. I have power to take it again. The very fact that we have a risen savior, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and on the third day, he arose again according to the scriptures. And so we have our Lord Jesus Christ seated in heaven. One day he's coming back to call the Christians home to heaven before God brings judgment on a world that has rejected him. Are, are you ready? Do you have a moment in your life when you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus? We will all die, absolutely. But the Bible also tells us that the Lord Jesus will come and call the Christians home. It's wonderful to think that we have that hope a hope that nothing in this world can give you apart from the only hope source of hope is our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you have this hope in him? Uh, I'm going to finish off here, but let me just simply say this, that here is this young girl. She was completely unable to help herself, but yet the Lord Jesus goes in and we see here in uh, verse 35 that he was detained. And because of that, for a moment, she passed away. But yet the Lord Jesus said here in verse 36, be not afraid, only believe. And you notice, I want to point out here in verse 39, that he says that this young girl is not dead, but sleepeth. It's a wonderful illustration, isn't it? That somebody that is asleep will, be, will wake up once again. And that's a lovely description of every individual that knows the Lord Jesus as your savior, that when they pass from this scene into the next, when they, when they die, they will be raised up. They will wake again in God's presence for all eternity. Do you have that peace and comfort? We have a tremendous miracle here in Mark's gospel chapter five. There were two people that needed urgent emergency care. They met the Lord Jesus, and as a result of that care, as a result of his power, they were both healed. They were completely made whole. Can I ask you tonight at the end of this gospel meeting, do you want to be made whole from your sin? There is nothing in this world that will bring you uh, that wholeness, that healing, apart from God's beloved son, the Lord Jesus. And just like an emergency, you need to make it a priority to get your sins forgiven, to have your sins forgiven through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me just say one more thing and then I'll close. But only this, when there is an emergency, 
we have to dial. Typically, if you were at home and you had an emergency or you were at work, unless you were in a hospital, you would dial 911. And obviously, the ambulance would come and medical attention would come, well, would come to your aid. But I want to be very, very clear. What happens if you were to dial 912 or you were to dial 914? You could be extremely sincere. You could be extremely hardworking. But if you didn't follow that, those instructions for help, exactly. If you did not dial 911, there would be no help. No matter uh, what, how much money you had in your bank account, no matter what your status was, regardless of that, you would have to follow that instruction exactly to get that help. I'm reminded of what the Lord Jesus could say in John chapter 14 and verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That means if you want to be in heaven, if you want to have your sins forgiven, it has to be through God's way, through God's Son. Just simply acknowledge that I am a guilty, hell-deserving sinner, but that when Jesus died on the cross, he died for me. Trust him tonight, and the Bible tells us that you will be saved for time and for eternity. Let's pray. Our Father, we bow in thy presence tonight, and we thank you once again for the privilege of being able to open up thy word. We have considered uh, solemn matters today. We've looked at illness and death and departure. But yet we thank thee that those individuals that were in the presence of thy son, they were completely healed and they lived. And so how we thank thee for the spiritual application that every sinner that is willing to acknowledge their guilty, helpless condition, but simply puts their faith and trust, their complete dependence upon the Lord Jesus, thy son, and his finished work upon the cross, we thank thee for the promise that they will have eternal life sins forgiven, and a home in heaven. We would pray for each one in our uh, audience tonight, and those that are through the online audience, we ask thy blessing upon them, that if there is somebody that is still outside of Christ, that they would make it their priority to deal with this spiritual emergency, that they would turn from their sin and put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved for time and for eternity. We, were, we ask thy blessing upon the gospel going forth in other places likewise, that uh, thou wouldst bless thy word, that thy son would be glorified, exalted, and uplifted, and uh, honored to the salvation of precious souls. For we ask these things, part of thy blessing, as we give thee our grateful thanks and ask these things in the name and for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.